Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it may be that you're listening to this. Welcome, I'm Brandon Knight, and this is My Seminary Life, Episode 2, where we'll be discussing Dr. Larry Crabb's book, The Pressure's Off. Welcome back to My Seminary Life, and if you're here for the first time, welcome. My Seminary Life is a weekly recap reflection show where I uh, sit down and go over the content from this week in my seminary class and give you some of my thoughts on it. And like I said, this week we're not going to be talking about Mr. Krabs, but Dr. Larry Crabb and his book, The Pressure's off. This is one of five required reads that I have for this class. I totally forgot how much reading you have to do in higher education. I've been a little overwhelmed with this, but things are all good. So one of five reads. I don't think we're going to have time over these next couple weeks to cover all five books in depth. For sure, uh, in a couple weeks, there's one we're going to spend some time talking about again. Uh, the other three, we j- I just might have to mention in passing. But The Pressure's Off is the first one that we have up. Um, before we uh, get too much into the content of this book, though, I did want to run a bit of a disclaimer again before... Uh, we get too in depth into it because I didn't think I was going to possibly get a little controversial by episode two. I was hoping to at least get to the fall semester when I think I have to take systematic theology before things were going to get a little um, debatable at times. And so I just want to reiterate the fact that these are just my reflections. I am in a state of growing, a state of learning. So if I Say something that you may not necessarily agree with. Don't don't start throwing stones too quickly, please. Please don't start throwing stones. Because um, I'm still just trying to figure out a lot of where I am at in life and a lot of where I am at uh, theologically as well. So again, these are my reflections, and I reserve the right to possibly change my mind later. Okay? So hopefully this isn't going to get too... Uh, controversial, but who knows? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I don't lose all of my listeners by episode two. But it's okay, because I guess if I do, then, you know, we'll just have a fresh start by the very next episode. So again, we're talking about Dr. Larry Crabb, who I just found out very recently uh, went to be went to go home to his Lord and Savior. It was uh, quite literally just back in February. Um, so that was almost like a week before I started this class. So um, kind of an interesting, interesting book to read during this time, knowing that he just recently went home because he does actually talk about his death a little bit in the book, like a, just like a like what he was hoping it would look like. Uh, so I'm kind of looking over my notes here. Where even to begin? All right. So in general, I think I think I like the book. I'm pretty sure I wrote uh, I like the book on Twitter. I gave it a six point seventy five out of ten ratings. Um, there were point, points that I really enjoyed, and I think it's because his writing style and a bulk of his theology, um, it looks very similar. It sounds very similar to that of John Eldridge, uh, author of Wild at Heart, who is one of my favorite authors. I've enjoyed uh, just about all of the books I've read by Eldridge. And then at other points in the book, uh, Crab would write something that would be completely different from, I think, anything John Eldridge would say, which not that Eldridge is like the end all be all or anything like that. It was just kind of funny to see these see these paths that they both have were, would write similarly, sound very similar. And then it would, you know, Crab would take this major turn of, oh, no, that's that's not the same at all. The other thing, though, so like I said, uh, I'm 
there are parts of this book that I did not quite enjoy. One theme running all throughout this book, and this is just a personal, like, just a kind of a personal uh, gripe I have with some books, is that it was very repetitive. I have such a hard time staying engaged with books that are very, very repetitive. And obviously, I don't know if a book is going to be really, really repetitive until I'm actually reading it, and then I'm stuck reading it because I have to read it for a class. I, I learned that I don't like this back when I was in undergrad I t when I took my gen ed uh, psychology class. And I had to read this book called Choice Theory. I think that's what it was called, Choice Theory. And this was early enough into my college days where I was still writing notes for everything. I would sit down and write notes about everything. And by the end of the book, I had one sentence written in my notebook from what I learned. Because the book was was just statement of the th each chapter. Each chapter was statement of the thesis. Example, restatement of the thesis. Turn the page. Statement of the thesis. Example. Restatement. It was just that over and over and over and over again. And I guess if your strategy for persuading persuading me to see your view is just to beat me to death with your thesis statement, then I guess I got the point. And that's kind of how it is here with Crab's book as well. I understand wanting to restate your thesis, restate your purpose. Obviously, being a preacher, I get that. I understand that. You want to keep bringing it up, bringing up your points, using the same language over and over again. But there is a way to do that without sounding so repetitive. There were points in this book where I had read three chapters in a row, and I got done, and I put my book down, and I thought, I, the, all three of these chapters said the same thing. There wasn't anything new. They all just said the exact same thing. And this book wasn't very long. It was a little, un a little over 200 pages long, but it could have been shorter still because he would just say his thesis, say his language, say his verbiage over and over, paragraph by paragraph. It was use the same examples, all this just kind of, okay, so I'm beating to death this. So you get the idea. Not too big of a fan of very, uh, very repetitive books. And again, I don't know how to figure that out until I'm actually reading it. So if, you, if you're like me and you don't like repetitive books, it, this might be a little bit of a hard one for you to get through. The part that I enjoyed about The Pressures Off was, I, I would say maybe the first half or so of the book, uh, was talking about how as Christians, a lot of us operate with a A- leads to B type of mentality. That if you want B in your life, then you need to figure out the A that will get you there. So the example that he uses often, often, a lot in his book is, if you want godly children, then read this book, follow these principles, and you will have godly children. A leads to B. Read this book, you'll have godly children. Speaking personally for me, I've been dealing with depression for about 10 years now. If I want to have no depression, if I want to be depression-free, I just need to find the right counselor that will give me the right tools to get it. A leads to B. The right counselor will equal no depression. And Crab kind of breaks down this mentality to prove that it is not right for us as Christians to operate with this mentality. And there's three reasons why. First off, it's very reminiscent of the law. The Mosaic law that Israel was under and that the people of Israel who have not come to know Jesus as Savior are still following. The law would dictate that if they followed the law, Israel would be blessed. And if they didn't follow the law... Israel be cursed. A leads to B. If Israel is ex was experiencing blessing, that means as a nation, they were following the law. If they were being taken into captivity, that means they had started following other gods. And the reason why this mentality, reason why this is a problem for us as Christians is that we're not under the law. We don't need to operate within a, a leads to B type of mentality that 
if we have blessings in our life right now, that means that we are, you know, doing the right things to get God to give us those blessings. That's, that's the old way. That's the old law. The second reason why this A leads to B mentality falls apart is because it leads to a mindset of retribution theology. Retribution theology teaches that if B is happening, that means A absolutely took place first. If you have a rebellious teen in your house, that means you absolutely did not parent them well. You did not put that that book you read, you didn't you didn't do you didn't follow the principles well enough. If I'm having a depressive episode, that means I did not follow my counselor's advice. A will always lead to B. And what we see in the book of Job, and I would also say the book of Ecclesiastes, is that that's unbiblical. It doesn't work. Yes, there are times where A could lead to B. There's plenty of times for that. But that doesn't mean that A will always lead to B. Life happens. In general, life is out of our control. We don't know what's going to happen. If you, if you didn't learn from 2020 that we don't know what could happen next, then you weren't paying attention closely enough. There's no guarantee I'm going to get through this podcast recording. Like, There's no guarantee you're going to get through this podcast re- recording. Isn't that morbid? A does not always lead to B. And the third reason why this mentality isn't right for us as Christians to have that A leads to B is that it actually is very similar to the prosperity gospel mentality. Now, the prosperity gospel, the word of faith, the health, wealth, and uh, health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, it is this, not really even a gospel, that promises the best life now. That hope that we as Christians have for eternity, those blessings and the fulfillment in life that we'll have in eternity, we can have that now if we read this guy's book and put their principles into practice. If we speak it out to God in faith. If we give a church, give a preacher enough money. If we pray with a prayer rug one night and then send it back and get an angel coin, that is it, that which is something that literally happened to me this week. I got that sent in the mail for some reason. Essentially, if you exercise enough faith by doing these things, God will richly bless you. God will give you those blessings now. A will lead to B. So this is actually pretty similar to last week when we talked about the broadness of legalism, that there is a broadness in the prosperity gospel mindset, even among the most conservative evangelical Christians who operate within this idea that if I want godly kids, I need to read this book. And I have a rebellious teen, that means I didn't read the book well enough. Because in the end, we can all put on the best church face, but ultimately, we want the good life. We can put on the best church face and say, oh no, I, I'm willing to suffer for Christ. If you ask any parent, I'm pretty sure they're going to want godly kids over a rebellious teen. Given the option between good health and cancer, I'm pretty confident most people are going to take the good health. I think I can speak I can speak for myself and I think I can speak broadly for most people in the mental health community that given the option between having a good day and being able to feel anything and not having depression, anxiety, self-harm, eating disorders, anything that usually falls into this category, I think most of us would take the good day where we could actually feel something that wasn't pain. We want the good life. And the hard pill for us to swallow as believers is that not only do we need to leave behind this A leads to B mentality, is that as believers on this journey in spiritual formation, in this walk with Christ, we need to desire God more 
than the blessings. We need to crave, we need to look for, we need to have our joy set in the blesser, not the blessing. We need to have God, not the center, but the highest point in our life. Our verse of the week is Psalm 34, verse 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And I like it how it doesn't say, taste and see if the Lord is good. Like it's inviting you to find out if God is good or not. You're tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. He is. He is good. You just need to come find out. So that was the first part of this book. And I, at this point, I am still very much on board. I definitely think that we need a lot of believers around this country to, and probably around the world, but around this country to get out of this mindset of, if I want B in my life, I need to find the A that will get me there. And instead, put Christ at the highest pinnacle of our life where he should be, so that way, in the blessing and in the pain, we still know that the Lord, he is good and that he is good and better than those blessings and blessing us through the pain. There was a portion of this book, though, where things started to kind of fall off the tracks for me a little bit. Uh, Crab never really uses this term, but basically this conversation turns into one on Christian hedonism. And at this point, I don't know where I really land on the whole Christian hedonism thing. And that's the controversial statement because one does not simply, you know, one does not simply disagree with John Piper. But Christian hedonism, for those of you who might not know what that is, uh, is a term and a syst- uh, theological system that is that was coined by John Piper in his book, Desiring God, which is a must read. If you asked me for my top five books that all Christians should read before they die outside of the Bible, Desiring God would be on that list. Like This is a very good book, don't get me wrong. The thesis of Desiring God is that the fulfillment of man, the purpose of man in life is to enjoy God forever. And again, I'm still on board at this point. I agree that that is what we are aiming for, that we are looking towards enjoying God forever. And that we should be doing that more and more in this life now. My thing is, I don't think if you follow the logic out on Christian hedonism, that it works fully in this life now. And I also think that Christian hedonism downplays the blessings that we do have in life right now, and the reality that God designed our bodies to experience physical pleasure now. Now, it's been a while since I've read Desiring God, and we're not really here to talk about Desiring God. So back to the pressures off, Crab writes that blessings are good, but they're dangerous. They're dangerous. So, because these blessings in our life, from, you know, children that behave, to cars that run, to whatever, any good thing that we have in life that could bring us some form of pleasure in life, they're good, they're good, but they're dangerous because they could take our mind off of pursuing God in the first place and rather start idolizing these other blessings in our life. And if we do, these th- if we do that, according to Crabbe, then God will become a jealous God. And like Hosea and Gomer, he will separate himself from us so that way we crave him more. Okay, so this is where I need to kind of weigh in a bit. If blessings are good, but they're dangerous, and God could separate himself from me if I start idolizing other things above him, then we need to get rid of everything. 
and all God's people said amen. But no, hold on. Before you say amen, everything, anything, any clothing that looks good on you, that makes you feel good, that you only get to eat bland food and drink water, any type of thing that engages the emotions like art or music, anything like that, even the ones that are supposed to you know, turn your attention back to God, you need to strip all of that away so that way you don't run the risk of idolizing them and God getting angry and separating himself from you. You need to live a monastic life if you follow Christian hedonism out logically. I understand that we need to be living in light of eternity now. I understand that. But I cannot do Christian hedonism out logically. I cannot follow this out logically right now. I can't. Because I think that gives me permission then to not enjoy anything in life. And I think God would be just as displeased if I belittled what he did give me the blessings I already did have, even if I never prayed for another one. I think God would be displeased if I did that instead of enjoying what he had for me now. So I just, I don't know. I'm just not quite on board with following through on Christian hedonism all the way. I just, I don't think it quite works now where I don't have a glorified, fully redeemed body, soul, and mind. When we get to heaven, that will be easy. It will be natural. Everything will be pointing back to God. But right now, I don't know. I kind of want to be like the preacher in Ecclesiastes and say, yes, serve God. That is the fulfillment of man. But hey, enjoy your life while you're still here. Enjoy those things that he has given you while you're still here. And also this bit about being a jealous God, like I I agree that God is a jealous God, but I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's grace. And yes, we're not supposed to be using grace so that w- grace so that way we can have a license to sin, but I think that means that when I do come up short, when I do idolize other things, he's not going to get angry with me and turn his back on me, but he's going to show me the grace and the mercy that I don't deserve and still continue to love me. Plus I have the Holy Spirit with me. So I, I, yeah, I'm just, this was the part I'm just not quite, I don't know if I was just not reading it correctly, or if I just wasn't, you know, I was tired when I read this portion or what, but there is this whole couple chapters chunk in the middle of the book that I was like, I, I don't like this book. I don't, I'm not getting this. How can I enjoy anything in life? And I understand that. And like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm bored with enjoying Christ more than anything else. Striving for our relationship with Christ more than anything else. But it's this, you can't enjoy anything else, or you might make God angry with you. Maybe it's not the right mentality to have, but my view of God has been, God the Father has been, you know that when the you know, your four-year-old like scribbles on a piece of paper and they bring him, bring that drawing to you, And as a parent, you could look at that and say, well, that's no Alex Ross. That's no Rembrandt. That's no Jim Steranko. I mean, it's good for a four-year-old kid, but whatever. You could act like that. Or there are those parents out there that they know it's not that great. But in that moment, they know that their child brought this to them as a gift. And so in that moment... That parent is going to be grateful, thankful, show love towards her, towards their child. And even if it's just up for a day, it's going to go up on the fridge in the place of honor for, you know, at least 24 hours. 
And that has been my view of God is that he's not some angry God who's going to turn his back on me anytime I make a little mistake, but that even when I bring him my best, that is just a scribbled up piece of paper. He's still going to love it because not because I tried my best, but because Jesus is standing there with me because Jesus is guiding me as I create this picture of scribbles. Okay, so that's rant number one. I have a little bit of a second rant coming up here in a second, um, and this is when I'll lose the rest of you. Crab does bring me back on board by the end of the book. Within the last three chapters, I was settled back in, comfortable, enjoying life again. One of the reasons is because he did recognize this whole thing I've been arguing about for the past 20 minutes or whatever. That So he doesn't call it Christian hedonism. In his book, he calls it the new way. That in within the new way, we can still pray for blessings. We can still pray for health for other people. Not only is it okay, it's biblical. But that we need to not find our joy in the results of those prayers, but in God still. Our joy does not come from blessings. It does not come from people not having cancer. It comes from God first. God above all else. Okay, I'm, I'm back on board. He also writes about how he would rather enjoy part of God now rather than the fullness of pleasures. I can also agree with that. I think that also goes along well with this conversation because we're not going to be able to fully experience like I was talking about earlier. We can't have that full experience of God now, even if we did strip everything away. But it's still better to have a partial taste of experiencing God now than to have the fullness of pleasures in this life. Again, kind of an Ecclesiastes type of mentality. And then, right before the end, Crab started talking about existentialism. And my heart gave a little leap. And this is when I'll lose the rest of you. When I was in college, I went through an existentialism phase, because most people do. I, uh, my life was, I believed in absolute truth and that it was in scripture, but my life was very much led by my feelings, my emotions, and my experiences during my college life. That was what was dictating a lot of my life, a lot of my theology, were those three things. Again, I believed in absolute truth and that it's in scripture and that all truth is God's truth. But I, I had a bit of this existential, experiential mentality in college. When I graduated, I recanted of my existentialism and embraced a more reformed type of mentality. I started studying God's word more. I started reading theology, reading church fathers, studying, 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 listening to good preachers, listening to good podcasts, intaking as much information as I could to renew my mind. And what I see now is that during my existentialism phase, I was being tossed to and fro throughout those college years. But when I turned to this more hard intellectual lifestyle, as good as it was, as proper as it is to study theology, study creeds, read your Bible more, as proper as that is, I was leading an A leads to B lifestyle. That I wanted to be further along in my sanctification, and in order to do that, I had to do these things. And what Crab writes here in next to the last chapter, a couple chapters for the end of the book, somewhere in there. What he writes is that part of spiritual formation is having an experience with God. That is how we grow. Having an actual experience with God. It's not 
because let me back up. The reason why we have to have an experience with God, a literal experience with God, is because life is a mystery. We don't know what's coming up around the bend. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And when we go through life, we have to exercise actual faith. Not A leads to B type of faith, but actual faith to get through it. And in order to do that, it's not jumping into the oblivion of the unknown. It's not jumping out and falling and God swoops in and catches you at the right moment. But it's a jumping off and falling, come what may, because you know when you land, you're going to land in the ocean of his grace. That is the one constant in life. That no matter what happens, God is still there. His grace is pouring out over us. So what I'm saying here is that we need the both. Yes, read. Yes, study. Yes, listen to good preaching. But we need to have that open palm as well, experiencing life, being led by God through existential, experiential moments, having moments with Him. So let's land the plane right here because I've, I've talked about a lot of different things. So here's, here's the summary. You ready? Okay. As Christians, we need to drop the A leads to B mentality. It's not going to get us very far. We need to get rid of this mentality in our life. And instead, have God, have Jesus above all else. We need to find our fullness, joy in all of life in him first. And we need to go through life, yes, studying the scriptures, yes, reading the church fathers, but with an open hand being led through an experience with God, knowing that his ocean of grace is moving us along. And I would also say, for those of us that are preachers, teachers, writers, content creators, whatever, people who are telling other people what to do, that maybe, maybe, in certain situations, we need to drop the guarantees a little bit. Let the text speak for itself. Let the text speak for itself. For itself, And there are certain portions of the Bible that are very clear, hey, do these things. You know, take the Lord's Prayer, for example. This is an example that Jesus gives his disciples, so this is an, an example for us on how to pray. Do that. Okay, that's good. But when it comes to very specific things to do, like, oh, you have mental health problems. Well, here, why don't you spend every time, a little bit of time every day writing something down that you're thankful for without the guarantee that that's going to make life better? Because there is no guarantee that that's going to make life better because the only thing that can make life better is God. The only thing that can bring me through this life, bring me joy in this life, is turning my face towards the Father and having an experience with Him. Knowing that He loves me, that, he, that I'm swimming in an ocean of His grace. Well, hey, if you've gotten to this point in the episode and you haven't turned it, out, turned it off out of frustration, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Please give us a subscribe and uh, write a review on whatever podcast platform you are streaming from. Again, Anchor Podcast is our home, but we're also on Spotify. And I believe here pretty soon we're going to be on Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, a lot of the other ones. As, uh, as I find out, I will, update the, uh, I will update social medias for that. If you would like to contact the show and tell me how wrong I am about Christian hedonism, you can head over to Twitter at my underscore seminary life. The M, the S, and the L are all capitalized. At my underscore seminary life on Twitter. 
I'm going to continue to use my personal social medias to kind of update friends and family. But if you would like more updates about the show in general throughout the week, uh, that's my Twitter page and I'm going to make it the unofficial official uh, social media for the show because I sometimes go through these phases where I'm like, why do I have Twitter? And so this will give me a reason to hold on to it for a little bit longer. Uh, so again, my underscore seminary life over on Twitter, you can DM me, you can at me, whatever you want. Um, I did not have time this week to be able to set up the donate or donut button over on Anchor Podcast so you can support the show. But my hope is to have something set up before the uh, before the end of this first class. And check checks notes to make sure he's hit everything. Uh, oh, okay. So looks like we're just about done. If you're sitting here listening and you think to yourself. Wow, an experience with God. That sounds great. How in the world do I even do that? Or if you're on the other side of the coin and you hear you can have an actual experience with God and you start smelling heresy, I would invite both of you to come back next week because God has given us a way to experience him even if just a little in this life, and that is through prayer. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. But until next time, Lord bless you all real good.